We are in the fourth segment of this study called the glorified Christ. Go with me tonight to John 12. John chapter 12. And we are going to center in on verse 23. But we're going to read just a little bit before that. John 12. Say amen if you have it. All right. Verse 20 says, now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. This is the feast of Passover. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Now, when when they say that, they're not saying we'd like to see him from afar. They're saying we'd like to have a personal interview with him. We would like to see Jesus personally. And Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified glorified. Lord, we pray that you will deposit in our hearts what you have reserved for this night by your Spirit in Jesus' name. The scenario is, is, is pretty clear. It's pretty simple. Here, here are uh, people gathering into Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover, which is a national holiday celebrating the deliverance of Israel out of the hand of Egypt and out of the land of Egypt and out of the oppression of Pharaoh. And, of course, it was the Passover uh, experience in Egypt that allowed them to have this revelation of deliverance and they put the blood on the doorpost of the Lamb. And, of course, it's a type of Christ's blood. All right. They don't, at the festival, at the feast, uh, here, that, that's not what they're celebrating. They're not celebrating uh, what Jesus is going to do that's not relevant to them. They're just memorializing and commemorating what God had done for them uh, back, of course, during the days of Moses. Now, it's interesting because there are some Greeks who show up at this thing. These obviously are proselytes to Judaism. Otherwise, they wouldn't be at the feast. They're people who have converted. They're Gentiles who have become Jews. They're proselytes to Judaism. And so, because of the nature of the fact that Jesus is present, and everybody already by this time knows he's a miracle worker, everybody by this time is pretty familiar with his resume. They understand who he is in terms of his ability uh, to heal the sick and raise the dead and do miracles, and he's a, a, a revolutionary, if you will. Uh, they they, they want to see him. The Greeks want to see him. And so they go to one of his disciples, and they go uh, to Philip. He says, they said, sir, we would like to see Jesus. And Philip goes to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip, Andrew and Philip in turn, Tell Jesus. Now, you you would wonder why it is that Philip doesn't go to Jesus himself. He had access to Jesus. Why didn't he go straight to Jesus? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, Andrew is a key component in evangelism. At the start of the accumulation of the disciples it's Andrew who goes and tells his brother Simon who will later become Peter we found the Messiah so he's a he's a key figure in personal evangelism so Philip knows hey if anybody knows how to bring people to Jesus it's Andrew Let, let me go let me go tell Andrew 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 will get it done Secondly, the other issue is that Philip still has some issues regarding the nature of of Jesus' divinity. He's the one who says, 
show us the Father. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So there are a couple of factors here that make him a little reticent to immediately go to Jesus, and so he gets Andrew. And so he and Andrew then go together, tag team. And they go and they tell Jesus that there are some Greeks who would like to see him. And Jesus replies in a very interesting manner. Because he doesn't make any reference to their request. He doesn't make any reference to the Greeks. He doesn't acknowledge the request. He doesn't even take issue with it, nor does he affirm it. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that is even relevant to that scenario that comes out of his mouth. Instead, he just stands there, and he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. It's kind of strange. I mean, if I said to you, hey, uh, uh, can, you, can, you, uh, 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 can you loan me five dollars, and, and you go, the hour has come for, I mean, it is time to go and eat pizza. I mean, you'd be like, wait a minute, I just, I just asked you something. There's a reason why. The hour has come. We're looking at this issue of the glorified Christ. The hour, everybody say the hour. So the hour has come, or it has arrived for the Son of Man to be glorified. That same Greek word, doxazo, D-O-X-A-Z-O, D-O-X-A-Z-O, doxazo. Made much of, worshipped, honored, praised. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, there's something that you need to understand quickly and succinctly, and that's that in contrast to earlier statements that Jesus had made about his hour or his time, he would tell people all the time, my hour has not yet come. His mother, hey, do this, my hour has not yet come. In numerous occasions in the Gospels, and especially in John's reiteration of the accounts of Jesus' life, he continually says, my hour has not yet come. It's not my time. It's not my time yet. It's not time yet. It's not time yet. It's not time yet. And all of a sudden, the prompting of a statement out of the mouth of Jesus is, is, is initiated. It, it's, it's, it's infused, compelled by a request of Greeks who want to see him. Strange. Not really. Because when he makes the statement, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, what he's saying is this, those who want to see me are going to see me. Those who want to see me in limited perspective are going to see me in a greater dimension once I'm glorified. I came not only for the lost tribes of Israel. I came not only for the Jew. I came not only for the sheep in the pen, but I have sheep in other pens that I've come for as well. He's talking about the Greeks. He's talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about the pagans, the heathens. But we'll come to the revelation of the knowledge and the realization that he is in fact the Christ of God. And so now he says, the hour has come. Now the interesting about, thing about the word hour is this. It, it, it's the Greek word aura, H-O-R-A, aura. But there's a specificity right here when he says this, when he says, the hour has come. Everybody say, has come. He said, the hour has come. Literally, watch this, watch this. They don't understand. They don't get it yet. We have said it over and over again. They never got it. They never got it. He said they wouldn't get it until the Holy Ghost would come in Acts 2. 
When he said hour, he literally was meaning this. He was very specific in the transmission of that Greek word. He was saying this, from nine in the morning till three in the afternoon will be my hour of glorification. He was on the cross at nine in the morning. He breathed his last at three in the afternoon. The hour of his glorification are the hours he's on the cross. The hour has come. When he makes that statement then, then this becomes the first statement in a number of statements after this that his death and his resurrection are at hand. All this time he's been saying it, my hour hasn't come, my hour hasn't come, my hour hasn't come. Look at your watch, my hour hasn't come, it's not time yet, it's not time yet. And all of a sudden he announces, why? Because there is now, watch this, there is now the need for the Gentile to see him, not only the Jew. Now he will fulfill John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son not just the Jew Jesus says it's now the hour for the world to see me now I don't have just Jews trying to find out who I am I got Greeks trying to find out who I am everybody wants to know and now they're going to know when they see me hanging on the cross they're going to know when they hear the statements that come out of my mouth they're going to know when they take me down off of that cross and they put me in a borrowed tomb and I come out of it three days later they're going to know the hour has come His hour of glory. Make sure you understand. That's a figurative term. Hour. His hour of glory is a reference. It's a direct throwback reference to Isaiah 52, 13, where Isaiah says 730 years before this even takes place, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Where was he raised to? Where was he lifted up to? And where was he exalted? He was raised up in the fact that he took your sin and he took mine and the sin of the whole world. He was lifted up on a cross and then he was exalted. Amen. Isaiah prophesies it. Jesus fulfills it and says, my hour has come. All of the prophetic words and events that were ever uttered, whether they have been by Isaiah, whether by Jeremiah, whether by Zechariah, Ezekiel, Daniel, whoever they were, David in the Psalms, whoever they were, whatever they were, all of the prophetic words and the events are now pointing directly to his approaching glorification. Philip and Andrew have trouble. They have difficulty in grasping the meaning of Jesus' statement because these Greeks want to see you. My hour is here. Wait, 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 excuse me. Wait, 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 wait. I just, Greeks, they want to see you? My hour is here. I'm going to show you a greater dimension of the reality of who I am than you could have ever gotten by sitting down with me for five minutes in a personal interview. They have trouble, they have difficulty in grasping the meaning of Jesus' statement. Not only that, but then they, they're befuddled 
by this whole issue of the hour. <laughs> the hour has come. Well, wait a minute. We heard him say it wasn't his time yet. Now he's saying it's time. And, it, and he won't see the Greeks. Do you get it? I don't get it. Hmm. But he also uses a term, a messianic term, when he says the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, what you have to realize is that they took the expression Son of Man when he made it, whenever he used it, it was his most familiar term, it was his most used expression concerning himself that we have in the Gospel of John. He says it over and over again. It's one of his favorite expressions. They take the expression when he says it, uh, Son of Man, they take it to mean the undefeatable world conqueror sent by God. Again, it's a messianic term. doesn't mean he was born of woman. That's not what it means. People misunderstand and misread, misuse, misapply all the time. Well, he was the Son of Man and Son of God. No, 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 no. Son of Man is a messianic term. And when they heard him say it, they said, ah, yes, that's him right there. That's the undefeatable world conqueror set, sent by God who is going to redeem Israel. Yes, we're going to be large and in charge again. The glory days of David are going to return. But they had no idea. They had no idea, they had no concept, they had no understanding of the reality of the fact that, of course, he had not come to establish a political kingdom. He had not come to establish an economic kingdom. He had not come to establish a social order. He had come to bring deliverance to the souls of men and bring the kingdom of God to earth. As the Son of Man, he is the anointed of God. He is the Messiah of God. He is the Christos Mashiach. They're confused. Secondly, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So then they hear the word glorified, and to their excited ears, their messianically excited ears, they, 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 they take the expression to, to mean that, that, that uh, the subjected kingdom of the earth would grovel before the conqueror's feet. He's going to be glorified. He's going to bring Rome under his feet. He's going to bring all these armies under his feet. He's going to bring all these people who have tried to mess with us all these years under his feet. He's going to liberate us. He's the great liberator. Yeah, he's going to be glorified. Yeah. No, 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 no. Jesus was saying, when I get done with all of this, I'm going to liberate man from the bondage of hell. And the enemy will be under my feet, not the kingdoms of the... The enemy will be under my feet, not political kingdoms. He has no need to deal with political kingdoms. You need to understand, oh, let me throw this in here. It'll cost you nothing tonight. I won't charge you for this one. When, when Satan tempted him and took him up to the top of the temple, and it, the Bible says he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, all you have to do is bow down and worship me, and I give you all this. Do you think for one single second that he was talking about political kingdoms? You think he was talking about physical empires? You think that he was talking about Rome? Do you think that he was talking about edifices and buildings and structures? And, 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 and things that man had built absolutely not he was talking about spiritual kingdoms that he had dominion over and he said if you will worship me I'll give you all the spiritual kingdoms that I'm in charge of I remember being a little boy in Sunday school and, and they were teaching us that story and they showed us palaces and kingdoms and they said and and satan said he would give them this and something didn't make sense to me i said why would jesus kneel down and worship him so he could get some buildings 
He who created everything out of nothing, why would he kneel down for a building? Why would he kneel down for an emperor? Why would he kneel? No, no, no. He was talking about the souls of men that were eternally in bondage until Jesus would set them free. And what Satan was trying to do was to keep him from going to the cross. You don't have to go to the cross. I'll give this to you now. He knew if he could keep him from the cross that he would never be defeated. The devil knows the Bible better than you do. And so these terms, son of man and glorified, they completely, completely misunderstand. But the full understanding of his own glorification was foreseen by Jesus. Nothing caught him by surprise when they accosted him in the garden. It was not a surprise when Judas betrayed him. It was not a surprise when they put him on the ground and they drove spikes in his hands and they drove nails through his... They, they, it was not a surprise to him. When they shouted, crucify him, it wasn't a surprise to him. He knew the moment they shouted Hosanna, he said, five days later, these people are going to call for my death. Nothing caught him by surprise. Everything was foreseen by him. He knows everything. So when he says, the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He's not deluded. He's not misunderstanding. He's not saying, oh, I'm going to be lifted up. and I'm going to step into my kingdom here on earth now. Oh, oh what? 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 It's not going to happen that way? No, 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 no. He understood completely everything that he was saying. The, the, the hour, say hour one more time. The, the, the hour of divine decision when he says my hour the hour for the son of man has come to be glorified this was the hour that would lead uh, to everything that had been predetermined this was the hour of divine decision which had been set by predetermined counsel and foreknowledge of God He's saying it's here now. That which was established, planned, ordained before the foundation of the world is here. It's here. It's time. Like a woman who's about to give birth and she knows it and she looks at her husband and she goes, it's time. It's time. He said, it's time. It's in my body bosom it's time it's in my belly it's time it's about ready to burst out of me it's time I've got eternity contained in my inner being I, I've got it in my humanity it's time for this to be released the hour has come Everything that's been planned before the foundation of the world everything that's been prophesied for centuries this hour has come This was the hour that would lead to everything that was established before the beginning of time. And out of that hour, out of that hour, out of that hour, flowed the greatest triumph ever to come to the world. Out of that hour came your salvation. Out of that hour came your healing. Out of that hour came your deliverance. Out of that hour came your atonement. Out of that hour came your redemption. Out of that hour came your justification. Out of that hour came your prosperity. Out of that hour came your peace. Out of that hour came your joy. Out of that hour came your provision. Out of that hour came everything and every blessing you will ever need on this earth. Out of that hour. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Hallelujah. 
What you need to understand is that the hour was necessary in order for Jesus to be glorified. Jesus could not be fully glorified outside of his hour. He had to go through all of it. He couldn't just look at the exaltation at the right hand of the Father and say, I'm going straight there from here. He couldn't just say, I'm anticipating the ascension and I'm going straight there from here. Uh, He couldn't just look at the glorious resurrection and say, I'm going there from here. No, he had to deal with Good Friday. He had to deal with Judas' betrayal. He had to deal with and anticipate Peter's rejection of him around the campfire. You see, glorification in is painful. Everybody wants pie in the sky by and by. Everybody wants it nice and sweet, and we want all of the whipped cream with the cherry on top. And the no- we want that. That's what we want. And 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 he says, no. There, there's some crushing that has to happen before you get that. Jesus' declaration that his hour had come means that, watch this. Oh God, this is so good. His declaration that his hour had come means that it was the readiness of the occasion of his transition to his glorification. The readiness of the occasion. Nine o'clock's been waiting for me. The cross has been waiting for me. Mount Calvary has been prepared for me. Ah, The crushing of my body. The tearing of my flesh. The defilement and the disregard for the reality of who I am has been waiting for me. For me, this occasion has been ready since before the foundation of the world. I am the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. But you see, it was the occasion of his transition to glorification. Everything that you go through in your life is an occasion waiting to transition you to glorification. I'm going through something right now. I don't like it. It doesn't feel good. It's uncomfortable. I don't understand it. It's your occasion to glorification. It's your transition. Shout transition. I'm ready to transition. I'm ready to move. I'm ready. I'll go through this thing, but there's something better on the other side of it. His hour means that there was a process by which he would be glorified. Completing his earthly ministry and thereby beginning his heavenly ministry. Everything you're going through right now is just setting you up for a higher dimension of the revelation of the glory of God in your life. But you got to go through this here and now. You got to complete this here and now. 
The healing that you're waiting on is coming, but you got to go through this season. But there's a transition coming. Your transition is going to end in glorification. It's the most, this hour is the most dramatic case in point of the pattern of the Christian life that exists for all time. As long as you are here, you will go through. But you must, you must go through to get to. Everybody say, I'm transitioning. Say, I've got to complete this. Say, it's got to run its course. Say, there's a prophetic period that must be fulfilled before I can step into my next season of glorification. Now give him praise. Stand to your feet. Give him glory tonight. Come on. Come on. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Just come on. Come on. Praise him for the seek. Pa- praise him for the transition. Praise him for what's coming. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Come on. Give him glory. This thing won't last always. It's going to come to pass. It will come to pass. Ah, glory to God. Hallelujah. There's, there's transition. There's an, this is the occasion of your transition. That's going to lead to your glorification in Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Lord, we thank you for what's waiting for us now. And we shall see it by faith. In Jesus' name. Now bless your people. Amen.